Get ready to thrive with episode number 11. Great day, amazing humans. Yes, welcome to the Own Your Thrive podcast and Empowered in My Skin production. My name is Nkechi Waffer Robinson, and I am founder and CEO of Empowered in My Skin, an experienced technology executive at one of Canada's largest financial institutions, an author, an international federation of bodybuilding pro athlete, an inspirational speaker, and most recently, a viral sensation after my You Matter speech hit over 3 million views worldwide. This show is all about thriving. And I will be bringing on some amazing humans that own their thrive to help you figure out how you too can own yours. So please leave a review on whatever medium you are listening to this on and make sure to join along on the web at empoweredomyskin.com so you can be notified when new episodes are available. For now, I'm your girl. Let the show begin. Great day, amazing humans. Yes, I'm so so excited for today's interview. And the reason why is because I'm interviewing somebody who I've known for almost three decades, really. Yeah. She's one of my greatest, greatest, I don't even call friends, family, but she like friend, you know? And uh, she's an experienced vice president of public and government affairs with a demonstrated history of working in the technology and broadcast media industry. She is skilled in strategic negotiations, and boy, can she negotiate, revenue and profit enhancement, corporate event management, government affairs, and corporate communications. She graduated from Harvard Business School with an executive MBA program. She is born in St. John's, Newfoundland, raised in Montreal, Quebec, and, and Lagos, Nigeria. She's an active in numerous civic and business organizations. She's the member of the Federal Communications Bar Association and has served on the board of directors of Somos Incorporated, the telecommunications industry, trusted toll-free number administrator, as well as U.S. Department of of state African women's entrepreneurship program. So I want you to put your ears together because this is going to be amazing conversation between two phenomenal friends. Put your ears together for Neka (laughs) Chiazo. Ink, I've never heard put your ears together before. That's new. That's yeah, because they're all listening. They're going to put their hands together. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> they probably have their, like, <laughs> their ears are supposed to be listening. They're not looking at us. They're just, you know, you're smart. smart. You're smart. I know. I tend to be smart. <laughs> so how are you doing, girlfriend? I am doing great. I am doing really great. So to, to full transparency to everyone, like, the day I started my podcast, I sent out a note to this one. <laughs> I was back in February, <laughs> but in all fairness, sir, I was sent into the wrong email address. Uh-huh. And so we Wait. literally connected this Sunday. Sunday. Mm-hmm. No, Saturday. 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 And already mo- it's Monday. So she literally got on it right away. And that's exactly who she is. And that's why I brought her on because she is a no nonsense, get it done kind of human. And so Neka, you are a thriver. And it wasn't very hard for me to reach, to recognize that I wanted to get you on this podcast. One, because you're one of my best friends in the, on the entire planet. But two, because I've always been inspired from you, by you. You know, the minute I met you at Concordia University back in 1990, like six, no, no, 92. Um, you know, I've just, uh, I've, I've been extremely inspired by the kind of human you are and your level, your intelligence and just your you know, just that human factor that you have. So thank you so much for being such an amazing, amazing, amazing friend. Thank you, love. Okay, so enough with the mush. Okay, so now we get (laughs) Now we go in, girl. I know. So (laughs) my first question to you is... Okay, go for it. If I were to ask you, tell me about the brand, Neka Chiazor, (laughs) what would you tell me? Ooh, oh, that is a... That is a lovely question. Yes, I believe that you've been quoted as having said that question to somebody during a lunch hour. And I thought it was very fitting for me to ask you. The NECA Chiazo brand is a brand that has evolved over time. Mm. Um, And it is a brand that is born out of um, humility, Mm. right? It is a brand that was born out of seeing, of having parents who 
gave their very best every day mm -hmm. um, to ensure that I could be the better person that I can be. And so that brand has evolved today to be one that believes in owning every moment, mm -hmm. um, in owning the thrive. Mm -hmm. And it's also a brand that had, has decided that I will no longer be less than for other people to feel more than. Ooh. And that took me a while. And it, and it, it took, so it took you a while. So how did you, how'd you get there? Cause that's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. I think I got there I, and I realized that there's so many people I met along the way that helped me get there. Mm -hmm. um, meeting you in 1992, I'll never forget. <laughs> 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 but you know, one of the things I love about you and Kichi is I think you're always authentic. Oh, thank you. Always yourself always yourself mm -hmm. and i learned that that i love ink doesn't mm -hmm. matter what it's always herself right thank you and you and you don't have to be less than who you are mm -hmm. to be you right yeah. so i learned yeah. that from you uh learning it from um some other people that i meet like some of the people that i work with who come to me and they're like i have xyz problem and i'm saying to myself wow I've struggled with that for a long time, mm -hmm. but I held back because I didn't want, I thought it would diminish me. Mm -hmm. like, and these are the challenges that I have, not realizing maybe that was the gift God had given me mm -hmm. for me to help others. And so mm -hmm. that's what I mean by it's evolved over time. It's been one of those encounters or experiences that as I mature, as I grow on my journey, I'm saying to myself, I don't need to diminish myself beauty marks or warts. I just need to accept who I am in that moment and lift anybody else that I can lift up as, a, in, as part of my acceptance. I love that. And, you know, I'll be honest with you. I truly believe that life experiences, as, as we evolve, we actually are naturally led to, to who we truly are at our core, right? Because there's a lot of what you say that, as I think back to, you know, when I, um, you know, university and when I met you, it's not that far off. You know, it's sometimes like, I know, I, I appreciate that you say that you've always felt my authenticity, but I didn't, like, for me, I didn't, I, it's easy for me to accept you say that now because I've gotten there. Like I'm getting there more and more. Right. But if I think back to when we first met, I, based on all of the things I've had to unpack and unfold, you know, there were, there was a lot of moments where I wasn't, I wasn't living my true self, right. Cause I was hiding behind fear and, and fear. We know what that can do. So what are you the CEO of? Ooh, I used to be the CEO. I used to be the chief everything officer. <laughs> <laughs> you gave up on the every, that's a good one. I never actually heard that before. Yeah. Oh yeah. The chief okay. everything, everything officer. <laughs> I used to be the chief everything officer. I used to be, I so used to be that. And now I I'm owning being the CEO mm -hmm. of transparency. Mm. And what I mean by that is not brutal honesty. Mm. It's something that I realize now that I used to practice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, so this is like, when you interview someone, I also recognize because Julie is somebody else, Easton is somebody else. When you interview people that you really know, oh, right, it's like, right. you say one thing, You're like, like, oh, yeah. there's a yeah. whole bunch of, and the <laughs> listeners have absolutely no idea. They're like, what are they talking about? So I have to get better. Okay, so let me, let yeah, me no, get I, No, but it's true. It's true, though. I was brutally honest, and to a certain extent, I think I am, but what I'm realizing is I'm the CEO of transparency, of, of empowering people. Mm. information and clarity mm. right and so with that i realize now more than ever it's a gift i, I mm. it's, it's something now that i'm saying oh this is what i want to be the ceo of mm -hmm. and if mm -hmm. i could use one word to describe it it's inclusion i I'm love that ceo of inclusion mm -hmm. making sure that people are brought to the table mm -hmm. giving people a seat to the table on mm -hmm. the table right mm -hmm. ensuring that voices that are not heard are heard mm -hmm. right? This is the time. That's what uh, 
CEO. Yeah, and I love that. And I can definitely say that, that you are your legacy is 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 that. I mean, our legacy is is continues to evolve as well. But I would definitely say that you are definitely known for making people feel included. And that's a special gift. So thank you. So it's interesting because you have found a career in communications, right? Which requires a level of diplomacy and knowing how to communicate. And so if you could talk a bit about how you, I mean, we studied math and, comp- and computer science. How I did, know. I know. <laughs> so how did your career evolve and what have been some of the key highlights? Because I know you've done work with the White House and you have a pretty illustrious career. So I'd love you to talk a bit about that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because when I started, if you remember, my first year in Concordia, my first semester, I was studying math. Mm-hmm. Right, and then I remember I, that's what we yeah we were, we were both in math. And I moved from math to computer science, and now when I look back, when I think about computer science, it's a language. Mm-hmm. It's a communication. Yeah, so that's language. true. Yeah, you're right. right. That's good. Just point. Like every other language, it has a syntax, it has its rules, it has mm-hmm. protocol, and so I find myself now in this communication role where I'm looking at it as another language, mm-hmm. and sometimes as communicators in that role there is the need for diplomatic communication. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes there is not. Yes, <laughs> right? It's keeping it raw and real. <laughs> and, and I realize that it really comes back to the audience and what's in it for the audience. What's mm-hmm. in it for that person? Mm-hmm. How do they want to be communicated with? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that piece. And then there's also the aspect of how should they be communicated with? Just because someone wants to receive information a particular way doesn't mean necessarily they're not open to other ways of getting Mm -hmm. information, Mm -hmm. but how do you do it? Mm -hmm. And so having computer science as a background, I think has been very helpful in a very interesting way because I approach communication from an unorthodox perspective, Mm -hmm. which is me, right? Mm -hmm. But it also has afforded me the opportunity to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. So most communications executives and writ large communications as an industry, Mm -hmm. public relations communications has been predominantly white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has been predominantly Mm Anglo-Saxon and it has uh, been predominantly male, Mm -hmm. although that's changing. Mm -hmm. Having an opportunity to be a seat at the table to ensure that communications includes others, Mm -hmm. I find it so rewarding, right? So... (laughs) I'll just give you a quick example and I'll, I'll let you get to your next question with the coronavirus as an example. Yeah, it was just um, about, to, uh, it's good that right? you're going there. So thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was speaking to someone on my team and she, I reached out to her and we were talking, um, African-American lady, young lady. And I told her, I said, wow, you know, I'm really concerned that people are using alcohol to make hand sanitizers. There's a risk to that. And she said, oh, you know, people are going to 7-Eleven. And I, and I said, what are they doing? She's like, oh, they're buying like alcohol. And I told her, I said, what? Are you telling me people are going to 7-Eleven and they're buying like absolute vodka if they can and they're using it to make hand sanitizers? So she's like, I love talking to you. You just broke it down. And I said, yeah, that is crunk. That should not happen. <laughs> we need to stop that. Crunk is not proper English. But then she's like, oh, I wish you could just put that on a tweet somewhere. And I told her, I said, well, why not? The only way we're going to reach that particular audience yeah. is by speaking the language that they understand, yeah. that they can relate to. Mm-hmm. So coming in with the queen's language, thou shall not use hand sanitizer with absolute vodka that's 70%, right. may not work or get to that group. Right, 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 right. But saying, yo, lay off on the vodka don't mix it with aloe vera that could be dangerous or hazardous for your hands right am i am i able to engage and include them in this very important topic right right so why not right but it's interesting because i think that that applies to any type of like you can apply that to any relationship you'll get the most success when you learn to communicate at the level or in the way that whatever demographic or whomever you're trying to reach out to or get them to understand will understand. Right. And so that takes a lot of um, paying attention and understanding. So, so you talk about an an, an unorthodox method to how you, you know, sort of approach communication. Then you clearly also are, you know, a, a minority in this industry 
So how do you find your voice at a table where A, you know, pretty much no one at the table really looks like you. And two, if you're coming in with an unorthodox approach, then nobody really thinks like you either. So how has that experience evolved for you? It has been very interesting. (laughs) (laughs) And here's what I mean by interesting, because when we talk about inclusion, you know, we tend to think of inclusion on racial lines. That's or, mm-hmm. or racial lines, gender lines, right? Mm-hmm. Some of the obvious lines. We never really think about or talk about it, not never, but we hardly talk about it from an intellectual perspective. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The I am the computer science degree holder at the mm-hmm. table with people who are PhD holders in communications. Mm-hmm. So I am viewed as lesser than, mm-hmm. right? There, mm-hmm. there is that. Mm-hmm. How do you deal with that? How I've dealt with it is very simple. I yell. I I'm sorry? Up. I yell. <laughs> you, you, you raise your voice? I, raise, I speak up. Okay. Speak up. <laughs> well, which one? Do you speak up or do you yell? Well, and so that's an interesting thing, right? Because culturally, when I speak up, some people hear it as yelling. So I'm okay. like, okay, I'm yelling. Okay. But I'm going to make sure. <laughs> By the time I'm done, you would have heard me. And if you don't hear me, you will see me in writing. Yes. I get a video. Yes. I show up. Right. Okay. And mm-hmm. I try not to let that stop me. Mm-hmm. Now, I try to find ways to the extent I can to show up in a way that that party I'm trying to reach understands. Mm-hmm. But I also recognize, too, that I can be a purple cow, which means I am a unique individual. So it doesn't matter. Is a purple cow the same say. as a unicorn? The purple cow is the same as unicorn, yes. Okay, okay. So I've heard that. see purple cows. Okay. <laughs> Right. <laughs> By the way, I, just for the, in case those listeners miss, I'm talking to someone who's born in Newfoundland, right? raised in Montreal and Nigeria, and now lives in America. So the lingo may not be, what, were, be, what yeah. were you saying? Purple okay. cow. Purple cow. Okay. Unicorn. So you're a purple cow. Okay. Purple cow. Yeah. So as a purple cow, when I get to the table, I move. And what mm-hmm. I mean by that is, if I've got to yell, not yell, yell like, oh my gosh. But if I have to speak up, I will mm-hmm. speak up. Mm-hmm. I do not let an opportunity pass to voice my concern or opinion mm-hmm. or thought. Mm-hmm. If I can't do it in the room, I find a way to do it after the room. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the after room is even more important than what's in the room. Right. Right. So. And have you learned, so as part of that, do you have the skill of navigating that there's that, you know, maybe there's maybe you are intentionally not saying something because it is better to have. And so, you know, how do you, in a, if you're in a, because I think this can help some listeners that are listening to this, but if you're in a, uh, a real situation, we always talk about, you know, make sure you have a voice at the table. You know, how would you, as an example, navigate when you know this, you know, here's the place to give the voice versus this is definitely something to take outside of the room. So I think, For me, it's, I've made this very simple for myself. If I know that if I don't say this in this room, Mm -hmm. it will never get said in this room. Mm. I will say it in that room. Got it. I don't say it once. I don't have to say it again. Got it. But I feel like I have to say it that one time. Right. Right. If it's something where I'm like, well, there's, if I don't say it, somebody else will say it or could Mm -hmm. say it, then I can Mm -hmm. take it outside. Okay. Mm-hmm. I like that. I, I almost call that, that's the, that's the, that's the statement. And I'm, I'm learning that. And that's where I'm stepping more into my bravery and courage is there are times where you, we are privileged. You and I, I would say that we, we are, we hold the privilege of being in certain rooms that many people, you know, only dream to. Like, I, I hate to say that, right? Like even at our level and there are times where I recognize that I had to get better at the statement messages because of the responsibility that we hold mm-hmm. of having that privilege. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So I like that. I like that. So thank you. The statement message. So it's easy to say that you're always in your thrive. And, but the main fact that you talk about, you've been involving, I truly believe that our thrive is, is a lot of times comes from, you know, gradual evolution, a long series of small wins, you know, bumps and bruises and tiny breakthroughs. 
And so can you talk of a time and where some experience, situation, circumstance knocked you off your thrive? And what tools and mechanisms did you reach for to pull you back in or to move forward through? Mm. I think there, I, I can think of a time, there are a few times, but one that stands out in my mind um, was a time when I had someone that I thought was in my corner mm. and I, I quickly realized, was made, made to realize that this person was not. Mm-hmm. It really threw me for a loop, right? To be okay. betrayed by somebody who... I thought again was in my color, similar to me, same type of cultural background per se, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I I didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. It was one of those, I'm hearing, getting feedback, experiencing things that just did not align with what I thought my experience with this person was. Mm -hmm. And particularly because this was someone that I thought, hey, I thought we're on the same team. Mm -hmm. But I let that only go for one day. I said to myself, I'm going to mourn this like someone who's died for a day. Mm. I'm boy, and I'm going to come back swinging. Mm. And I bounced back. And how did I do it? There were other people who observed what I was going through Mm -hmm. that reached out and said, you know, this saw what happened. I don't think it's right. Mm -hmm. And hey, you know, if you want to talk, if you want someone to help you through this, let me know. I'll I'll be there for you. Mm -hmm. Normally, I wouldn't take it. I would say, mm-hmm. oh, you know, I got it. This time I leaned into it. It was amazing. It, it was people saying, yeah, we kind of knew that person was jacked up, but we didn't want to tell you because you thought you would be annoyed, which was good <laughs> feedback for me because mm-hmm. it made me realize that also in showing up and having a voice, mm-hmm. it's important for me to moderate that voice so that I can hear others or at least make others feel comfortable expressing a view that might be counter to what I'm holding dear. Right, right, right. So they feel comfortable. So, yeah. so in that particular situation, did it um, did it build the relationship? Did it tarnish it? It well, in, in particular with the people who were supportive of me, it built it big time. Like okay. those guys mm-hmm. in my book are golden. Um, this was someone who had accused me of doing things that eventually were found to be not true. Okay. So it worked out so well for me because <laughs> at the end of the day, it, mm-hmm. was, it, it's, it was almost like, oh no, it was what I was accused of not true. Mm-hmm. It then highlighted a lot of things that I were doing that were so contrary to what I was being accused of. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't bad. It was really an accusation of creating a toxic workplace, mm-hmm. which is so not me. Mm-hmm. But it, it really bothered me because I said, No, I'm too transparent for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what I found joy in is the fact that my belief in transparency, like that transparency, people were stepping up to say, no, that's not true. She, she's very open. She, she can be brutally honest. She she actually said. And so I learned that, you know, trusting people, leaning on people Mm -hmm. and staying true to you, it Mm -hmm. will come through. Yeah, you know, uh, there's a quote that comes to mind as you say that, you know, when you're just when you're just good, you you actually would then need to tell people, no, I'm not like that. But when you're great, people team up to tell everyone how you are, like who you are and how great you are. Yeah. So you are great. Thank you. I know you mentioned you have an an orthodox approach to communications. And I wasn't really planning to ask you this, but I recognize that you have an unorthodox (laughs) way to life period. (laughs) And it's interesting because, you know, uh, you're also a mother, a mother of two beautiful, beautiful young ladies, one of which is my goddaughter. Yeah. And I don't often get pictures, FYI. But <laughs> She's like almost 17. You should be back in the I'll beg her for pictures. <laughs> And I, you know, it's funny because I, I know um, there was one time I, I loved it when you, you and France, your family, you came to Toronto and we had gone out to Sochelle. You remember that? Yes, of and, course. Um, and it was a newly started to speak Mandarin to the serving lady. And I it was the weirdest thing on the planet. I'm looking at this young black 
you beautiful little girl talking Mandarin with the, with the server. And I remember I turned to you and said, and Uli speaks Mandarin? Like, why Mandarin? <laughs> right? And so I love you to, because that also speaks to how you think. Why was the, what was the whole reasoning around your kids learning Mandarin in the U.S.? <laughs> Thank you. See, when you put it like that, it sounds... sounds <laughs> well, Spanish, I would understand, but... Well, Mandarin Mandarin is the most popular language on the planet. Because, because so many people speak it. There are a lot of Chinese people out there. Right. <laughs> I'm not trying to be non-PC, but it's a fact. Yes. Um, tell you the most popular language on social media is mm -hmm. Mandarin. Mm -hmm. And also as a language, um, studies have shown that Mandarin, there's something about the Mandarin language and the construct mm -hmm. that helps children with their cognitive ability, mm -hmm. especially math. Mm -hmm. And so there was an opportunity for them to learn Mandarin. And I thought, why not? Right? Like, <laughs> and I believe they've helped you when you were in yes, when we China, went to China with your mom. Yes. yes. Two times we've gone to China. They've been our translators, cheap labor. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's awesome. And, you know, I share that because that's all part of your thrive. Like you, you, you are someone who doesn't conform never. And, and I believe that that's why you always rise to the top. You know, you worked in Washington, you know, and that must've been a very different experience. Oh yeah. That's, that was wild. Yeah, can you talk about and I and I know you've also had some White House, um, yeah, White House experiences with you know our our first black president, That's or, right. our second if you count Clinton, but <laughs> yeah, our first black president. And what was that? What was that like? That was amazing. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. Um, president Obama was just he was a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. That was just a, he was like Hallie's comment. It's just a once in a lifetime unicorn experience. Talk mm -hmm. about purple cow. Yeah, that was a purple, a purple cow, cow experience. Cow. Okay. Right? That was, that's purple cow. <laughs> Father is Kenyan. His late dad was Kenyan. Mother was white. Grandparents from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Has a half sister from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get any more diverse than that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the experience, what I, I found was it was such an energetic time to be in Washington, mm -hmm. to be part of society where you're making public policy decisions that are focused on advancing the public, mm -hmm. um, doing no harm to the public, mm -hmm. and more importantly, looking at the next generation. Mm -hmm. Obama was so focused on how do we make it a better America for the next generation? Mm -hmm. And then how do we make it a better world for the next generation? Mm -hmm. So working on those types of policies with people who were um, very intellectually advanced and mm -hmm. who were very committed, mm -hmm. it was just a riveting time, riveting. And so when he left office, was that your transition point to get you to where you are on today? Did that sort of start that yes. journey? So when mm -hmm. he left, before he left office, what uh, the role I played was, the communication sector. So in the mm -hmm. United States, we have about 21 sectors that are considered critical. And critical means they're essential to the lifeblood of our economy. Mm -hmm. And the criticality is, de is designated by the US Department of Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. And so the financial services sector is critical, water sector is critical, agriculture, the communication sector is also critical. And communications covers uh, the telecom industry, the technology industry, media. And so because the, those sectors are considered critical, the U.S. government under Obama set up liaisons to work with his administration on advancing policies, best practices to fortify those sectors. Mm -hmm. And so as part of that, I was chair of the communication sector council and my responsibility there was interfacing with the Department of Homeland Security and the White House and the Obama administration on what is the telecommunications, broadcast, media, satellite, wireless industry? What are we doing as a sector mm -hmm. to ensure the resiliency of America? Wow. Amazing. Amazing. I chaired that body for a year. Yeah. It was just, it was really, we did some 
solid work. Mm -hmm. It was nonstop work. Mm -hmm. But I can say a lot of the work that we did then, and this, mm -hmm. and I was chair 2016 to 2017. Mm -hmm. 2017, the Trump administration took over. Mm -hmm. A lot of the work we did then, Inc., is informing our response as a sector to COVID-19? To COVID-19. I was just about to ask you, as you sit back and you watch how COVID-19 is being communicated, you know, is, can you see your work in there? I definitely see my work mm -hmm. in there. I see the work of not just me, but the work of the sector. Mm -hmm. I see the best practices. I mm -hmm. see the working group sessions where we talked about, so what happens when you have a virus in a cyber context? Mm -hmm. How do you draw parallels to a virus in the human. pandemic context, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I see it. Wow. Yep. Wow. And so do you also see gaps? <clears throat> I do see gaps. Mm -hmm. Some of the gaps I see are as follows. When we finished our work 2016, 2017, Trump administration took over. The focus shifted. Um, the White House focus shifted to economic policies. Mm -hmm. There was less of a focus, I would say, on best practices, mm -hmm. which we're seeing playing out now. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it also became very partisan. Washington became very partisan. Mm -hmm. When we were doing this work, it didn't matter whether you were a Democrat or a Republican. Yeah. What mattered was you were doing this to fortify America. America, right. For the greater good. For the greater good. Mm -hmm. Right. Like mm -hmm. I remember there was a White House uh, roundtable discussion we had at the time where we talked about affordable Internet and how do we bridge the digital divide. Mm -hmm. And Obama's officials, this was back in 2015, 2016, mm -hmm. were talking about. Let's talk about divides. Let's talk about divides in the financial services sector. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that people have access to mobile banking? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about you know, divide in the communications sector. How do you ensure that people have access to affordable internet? Mm -hmm. It was those discussions that led a number of folks in our industry to say, we're going to, going to start offering different products geared towards making sure low-income families have internet. internet yeah. mm -hmm. It led to a number of financial services firms offering financial literacy classes mm -hmm. online to educate people on mobile mm -hmm. banking, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? That, and then once we shifted uh, administrations, it changed. So, so now you are formally working for a communications company, Cox Communications. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I just, I want to commend you because I watched, um, I watched some videos. So you guys recently did something that was so, so humanitarian. It's just such a... It, it was a feel good experience just watching it. And I, you donated $50,000 to, to food banks and you did a bunch, you did five. You did, you did your research. Yeah. You did five <laughs> surprise reveals and I watched them all. And so, you know, just as we, you know, before I start on the rapid round, you know, how did that come to be and, and take us through that? Cause I do know that food banks at this time are, are really suffering and I believe that in one of the videos you talked about, this came about with one conversation from one woman. Yeah. Well, one woman, uh, Dr. Ruth Nichols. Mm -hmm. She uh, runs this food bank, Southeast Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to her on a Monday. I want to say two Mondays ago, maybe two Mondays today, mm -hmm. two Mondays today, actually. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it was interesting, Inc. The night before, the week before, last week, uh, last week, last day of February, Black History Month, mm -hmm. I run into her husband and I say, you know, I, I really want to do something with Ruth. It was just on my mind. Mm -hmm. That's her, you know, his wife. He's like, just reach out to her. And I didn't. Sunday night before, two Sundays ago, I'm sitting at, at home, I'm watching this and I say to myself, wait a second, if, if the government decides to close down schools, what's going to happen to those kids who get mm -hmm. free meals at school? Mm -hmm. what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And I thought about that because when I was in Nigeria, when I was in boarding school, as you know, our meal system was jacked up. Okay. Mm -hmm. We didn't have, sometimes we had meals once a day, maybe once <laughs> 1.5 times, mm -hmm. but that was Nigeria. And I'm thinking here, what are these kids going to do? I have to reach out to Ruth. Monday, I reach out to Ruth and I start telling her, I'm like, Ruth, there's so many things we're doing at Cox. We have this affordable internet program. Would you like to partner 
And she said, you know what, Naka, can I just be transparent with you? I say, yes. she's like, we're hurting right now. We don't know where food is going to come from because people are scrambling for food. The food banks are hurting. I am all about getting these kids internet. And I know you want to get them internet and food, but right now the food banks are hurting. Like the food mm -hmm. banks are running short of food. Mm -hmm. I, think I never imagined that a food bank it's, yeah, a would run a, it's a bank, right? It's a would bank. Run a, right. Would be Endless supply. Right. It, it, like, it, these are, I, I just, and I told her, one, I was embarrassed because I said, oh, wow, I sh I, I'm even putting on you, trying to help you. I didn't realize that I'm even making it harder. Mm -hmm. Let me think about what I can do. Mm -hmm. I reached out to my team and I said, we've got to do something for Food Bank Southeast. And they're like, yeah. And then we said, well, wait a second. That's not the only food bank. We have food banks across the state. Mm -hmm. Can we do something for all these food banks? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why, why can't we do something for the food banks? Let's mm -hmm. see what we can do for the food banks. Mm -hmm. That's how it started. In. Wow. And then you found five food banks. Five food banks. And so and one food bank, the food bank. Oh, my gosh. I can start crying. The food bank, Meals on Wheels, Roanoke had given out their last bag of food when we called. Wow. Inc., they didn't know we were going to call. Wow. Ruth, Dr. Nichols did not know we were going to do any of this. So what I'm trying mm -hmm. to explain to you is I had a conversation with Ruth on Monday. I didn't tell her, hey, Ruth, I'll get back to you. This is what we're going to do. I said, oh, I'm so sorry to put on you today. I'll, I'll call you another time. Because I was taken aback about mm -hmm. just the situation. Mm -hmm. Meals on Reels, Roanoke. Ron had given out his last bag of food when we called. I remember so I this man it. was just really just saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I, I can't really help you guys. Not knowing that there was going to be a surprise reveal. And so when we went through that experience with Roanoke Meals on Wheels, that just energized my team. Now yeah. it was, okay. Let's go after the food banks. Yes, yeah. Well, it's done, like, right? Mm -hmm. And so coming back to Ruth, we said, you know what? It's only right. Wait a second. We got to go back to what started this. Yes, yes. Going back to Ruth to say thank you for an open conversation. And we had supported the food bank there. But just to say thank you. And this week, today, this is how <laughs> mobilizing this has become. Mm -hmm. So today we gave $20,000 to Fairfax County Public Schools mm -hmm. to give meals to those kids mm -hmm. because of that food bank drive. Mm -hmm. right? And that's and celebrating our employees now said they want to give. Yeah. So it's just. That's like, awesome. It's, it's just one of those things where I just feel very blessed to mm -hmm. be in to serve as like a small medium of making mm -hmm. people feel included mm -hmm. when it comes to meals. Yeah. Um, and I just thank God for the conversation and the transparency. Yeah. She could have easily said, yeah, Naka, okay, we'll, we'll take whatever you have. But her just opening up and saying, no, I'm, this is what's happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. And, you know, thank you. And I knew that I wanted to make sure that I recognized that mm -hmm. because a lot of times it's those simple things that, you know, have the biggest impact. And anyone that's listening to this, it, it, it's not, I know it's changed me. I have a group and we're gathering money and we're going to go and buy some um, food and give to a food bank. So, you know, thank you so much for your generosity. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for yours. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to get to the speed round, girl. Speed round, girl. speed round. Okay, so when you think of thriving, who's the first person that comes to mind and why? You. Okay, you can't say me. I'm going to change that question. <laughs> you don't ask me the question. When I think so, of thriving, no, who comes to mind? And okay, you okay you're going to give two people. Give me and then somebody else. Okay. Okay, I'm going to start with the one I know. So okay. when it comes to thriving, two people that come to mind is you and let me say why. Because Inc., you've thrived through so many things in life. It's not an, even funny. I've seen you thrive as being the only Black kid on the block in Montreal. I've seen you thrive as being the only Black woman in the math program at Concordia. I've seen you thrive as being the one running operations when you were at Rogers. I've seen you thrive. <laughs> okay. I've seen you thrive. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we 
seeing you thrive on the stage as like, you know, Miss Olympus. Like, <laughs> seeing you thrive. <laughs> Thank like, you. Really? Thank you. Oh, yes. When, when, when you told me your show, you own your thrive, I'm like, yeah, that's ink right there. Yeah, I received okay. that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, now somebody else. <laughs> somebody else is hard. It's hard to stop that. It really is. Someone else that I've seen own thrive, I would say is my mom. Yeah, I was just about to say, how about your mom, yeah. man? That woman, that, that she, really, raised you. she raised you, man. She got really, a job. Yeah, that's a thriving woman. That's right a thrive there. right there. That's a thrive right there. Thrive forever. She raised your craziness. Yeah, she did raise your <laughs> Unicorn? She brought up a unicorn. <laughs> Can't say, I get, you know, but I've seen her thrive through hardship. Yeah. That's a different kind of thrive. Mm -hmm. That's a, you know, I'm going to make sure I'm good and everybody who's around me is good mm -hmm. and every village member of mine is good. Mm -hmm. type of life. She is a consummate businesswoman, man. She's one yeah. of the best businesswomen I know. She you is. Math right now, she's almost 70. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. She's making moves, man. Okay, what, um, so next question. What book has helped you with your Thrive? Ooh, the five love languages. Ooh, that's a different one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm glad you read it. Did Francis read it? Francis is her husband. He says, yeah, Francis, he says he's read it, but reading and reading is, he skimmed it. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's your love language? My love language is words of appreciation. Okay. I appreciate you. Oh, I appreciate you. <laughs> what, is it, what is a daily what's your, act? What's your love language? What's your love language? Acts of service? I like that. Yeah, I, I said it's either that or, or words of appreciation. I'm not a big on gifts. Yeah, I definitely do like a good hug. So I, I think there was a couple, there was a few different ones that really um, definitely like acts of service, although most people don't know that I need help because <laughs> I don't often ask for help, right? I know. So what is a daily activity that helps you with your thrive? Oh, talking to people. Okay. Communications. <laughs> what is an app? And listening to music. And listening to music. Okay. And what is an app that helps you with your thrive? LinkedIn. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's different. I like that. And what is one misconception of you right now that people have as you thrive? Like as you're at the top of your game, regional vice president, on boards, two kids, wife, that, killing it. <laughs> that I think one, you said misconception? Yeah, misconception that people have of you as you're in your thrive that it's easy for me mm. that it's effortless mm. it's you make it look so so stop making it look so yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> because i think I, i'm like does this girl like is there anything she can't no, do no. any conversation that she can't have any <laughs> any achievement that she can't accomplish <laughs> yeah miss olympus not okay well that. that's <laughs> right but you know so <laughs> Neka, I celebrate you. Honestly, I, I, I have seen, I have seen the, the, a girl that, you know, went from $5 jeans, bell bottoms. <laughs> to be, I remember you said being asked if you, when you first came to Canada and you showed up and they asked you what kind of milk you drink and you're like goat milk. Like what the what kind of foolish question was that? I've seen you, you're a survivor, clearly. I, I mean, you know, to the listeners, we have some moments where Neka clearly took care of herself first before looking up for her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I was practicing social distancing. <laughs> but in all, in all, in all, I, I, I have seen you thrive, and I've seen you thrive through some of the most toughest situations. And I, I celebrate you. I celebrate you as a friend, and I celebrate you as a fellow human. And I love you, someone that I admire very much. And I'm very, very fortunate to have you in my life. So I thank you so much for being willing to come on my podcast. Thank you. Yes. Thank and you for having me. No problem. And, uh, and thank you for enriching us with your stories. Truly appreciate you. I appreciate you too. Keep the native tongue alive. Inc. I will. And to all the <laughs> listeners, this is where we say, or I say, we're out. <laughs> so there you have it. I hope you're thriving and thoroughly enjoyed this episode. And remember, whatever medium you are listening to this on, please subscribe, like, review, 
and share this podcast with somebody else that you think could benefit from the tips that were delivered. Because when we share, that is truly when we have the capacity and the power to change the world. It's been awesome hanging with you. It's your girl, and I'm out.